Governments collect taxes. They also give tax breaks, deductions, and credits. Ontario's Financial Accountability Office just released a report raising real concern that those tax breaks are growing more quickly than program spending. In fact, the FAO pointed out that if that expense had its own line in the budget, it would overshadow almost every other spending category. Here to help us figure this out, Sheila Block, Senior Economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, and Finn Poshman, Senior Fellow at the Fraser Institute. And we're delighted to welcome you two back to these parts in Midtown Toronto. Just so everybody understands what we're talking about. We know what a health expenditure is. We know what an education expenditure is. We know what expenditures on social services are. I'm not sure everybody's heard of a tax expenditure, so tell us what it is. Tax expenditures essentially are saying there are two ways you can deliver programs. Um, you can either deliver them through the tax system or you can deliver them directly. And I think the best example for that is the children's fitness tax credit. So on the one hand, governments can decide to use the tax system or you can decide to keep your recreation centers open longer or hire more uh, swimming instructors. So that's, that's the idea of a tax expenditure. It's where you deliver programs through the tax system rather than directly through spending. And in that case, I think it was Stephen Harper's government that basically if you put the kids in hockey or something, you, can, you could get a tax break for that expenditure. Absolutely. That's the way it worked. Do you think they have public policy value? They can absolutely have public policy value. Um, you want to use kind of the full suite of, of available policy options and decide which is most appropriate in which situation. So for sure they do. Generally speaking, Finn, do you agree that they have some public policy value? Oh, absolutely, they have to. Uh, at the broadest level, a tax expenditure is anything that uh, it allows a deduction from income or an exemption from income in arriving at your uh, taxable income for the year, and any credit or uh, benefit that uh, reduces after that your taxable, uh, rather, your income tax liability or your sales tax liability. We don't, uh, we don't charge HST on groceries for good or ill. Uh, and then there's the biggest section of all is uh, things that go to a, a describing, defining an appropriate tax base. For instance, uh, for, uh, for households, the RSP deduction or exemption is the single biggest one. Uh, I'm not sure you would call it a program, but most of us think that the allowing a deduction for RSPs and RPP contributions is an appropriate way to define taxable income. Okay, so far, you two are on the same page. Now is where we begin to diverge, I suspect, because I want to find out from each of you an example of what you think is a good tax expenditure and a bad tax expenditure. Sheila, what's your favorite example of what you would consider an egregious tax expenditure? Hmm. Well, let's go to the capital gains deduction. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, many years ago, there was... Uh, the kind of famous line that a buck is a buck is a buck. And what we see is capital gains tax expenditures, which are one of the biggest line items uh, in tax expenditures and which are really, really concentrated in the highest income earners uh, and which also kind of feed the kind of uh, stock market uh, uh, frenzy that we've been experiencing for the last number of years. So I think that's clearly a tax expenditure, poorly targeted, uh, and contributes to income inequality in Canada and is a big revenue loss because we really have to remember any money that we spend uh, that we don't collect is revenue that can't go towards program spending. So capital gains tax expenditure is number one on her hit list. How about you? Uh, first of all, would you comment on that? Do you agree that that is a terrible tax expenditure? It's uh, actually one of the very good ones that goes to appropriate definition of uh, taxable income. Uh, capital gains, uh, uh, if you think about it, uh, first of all com contain a pretty big inflationary component. So uh, if you bought a cottage property in 1968, uh, or your parents did, and uh, you wanted to sell it now, a huge component of what you'll be taxed on is the inf just the inflationary component, let it lay aside any uh, real estate appreciation. So one of the things that a low rate for capital gains or a lower rate than other income for capital gains allowed allows is some recognition of, uh, uh, of the inflationary component. Uh, there are plenty of boutique credits I would, I would hit 
like uh, special low rates for methanol and other fuels, uh, the film and production uh, television tax credit, digital media tax credits, the little targeted things that create constituencies but don't really do a lot for, for public policy or for defining an appropriate tax well, system. Let's pick up on the last one, the, the film and television tax credit, which, which the Ontario government says if they did not offer, we would lose a huge chunk of whatever happens in North America vis-a-vis uh, -vis film and television production, mostly in this capital city. What's your view of that tax expenditure? I think that actually is a targeted tax expenditure. There's actually a northern component is, of it as well. And <clears throat> that is one that actually can kind of has a measurable impact on economic activity. So it could be considered one that, uh, that you would keep. I knew I would find some disagreement <laughs> among you two, and we just it's did it. It's only just begun. And we've only just begun. Well, okay, let's do this, because I said off the top of the program that if you actually compared what we spend in tax expenditures to other programs in the budget, it's actually the number two. Sheldon, you want to bring this chart up, and I'll just go through this. These are numbers crunched by the Financial Accountability Officer of the province of Ontario. He's a neutral, nonpartisan uh, guy who crunches these numbers. His office does. And... You know, number one, of course, in the budget is health spending. We're going to spend $63.8 billion on health spending. But then look at number two on the list. Tax expenditures equivalent of $44.4 billion worth of tax breaks and credits and write-offs, et cetera. And then go further on down the list, and there's education and children's and social services, post-secondary education, and so on and so forth. So this is number two. It's the, it's the equivalent of number two in the budget. Uh, okay, Finn, is that good or bad? Uh, you'd have to look a lot, lot deeper. Uh, the, the single biggest uh, thing that we call a tax expenditure that, uh, that you're seeing in that category is uh, the basic personal amount. Uh, so, in other words, uh, we let people uh, earn more than 12000 It's pushing up towards 15000 over the next few years. Uh, and we're not taxed on the first, at either provincially or federally, on the first twelve dollars to $15,000 worth of income. a great way to make sure people who have low incomes don't pay any income tax. Yeah, well, maybe it is, but that's why we do it. Okay. And a lot of us think that it's appropriate that some people should, that uh, we, should, we should all earn some income before you start paying income tax. Sheila, do you have any objection to the fact that tax expenditures is the second largest item in the budget? I think it's really important information for us, particularly in the fiscal situation that we're in and with the government's priori priorities where they, where they are. I think there's been a really big emphasis on program spending and trying to, uh, government trying to, to reduce program spending. And I think it's really important to look at both sides of the ledger. And so I think it's a really helpful number there to to take a pause and to think, okay, where are we at with revenue? If we really are so concerned about debts and deficit, then we need to take a, a look at this and figure out, uh, as the FAO report suggested, which of these are still effective, which of these are less effective, and uh, how do we improve our bottom line here? Just so we completely understand this, Finn, governments obviously have two different approaches if they want to improve something. They can create a new program and spend money out of their budgets, or they can offer, as we've suggested here, tax breaks to people to go out and behave in a certain way and, and hope that they will get just as big a bang for the buck of the tax break that they offer. Do you have any sense about which works better to get to a certain goal? It depends on what the goal is, and either might be appropriate. Uh, but first, I mean, from, my, from a tax policy perspective, you want to do the things, keep the exemptions or deductions that are appropriate to defining your tax base. And what you do after that is uh, pretty much a political decision. The economics might point towards program spending in some cases, might point towards uh, a, t a tax deduction in others. Uh, but I'm leery uh, of, uh, of tax deductions or in increasing their number, uh, relying on them too much. And for much the same reasons that uh, Sheila hinted at, uh, unless you put a sunset clause in the legislation, once you create a deduction or an exemption, it's set it and forget it. And it just sits there until the government changes its mind or, the, or the, a new government comes in and decides, well, that was a mistake and let's not do that anymore. But even that's a problem because meanwhile, you've created a constituency for whatever the credit is. So uh, the federally, for instance, we went years and years without a deduction for uh, a volunteer firefighters' expenses. Governments fought it off. Then the government changed its mind. Uh, to go and change that back, you'd have to have the political fight all over again. Hmm. Sheila, we have seen uh, the, the Financial Bill Accountability Office, I mean, they did some good work on this. We, we now know that there are 150 different 
tax expenditures in a typical Ontario budget year amounting to that $44.4 billion. Would we have any guess as to what percentage of those 150 tax expenditures are useful versus just a sop to some special interest group because they, you know, lobbied hard? Yeah, I think I differ a bit from Finn in terms of, I don't think so, so much that there are sops to special interest groups, um, but I think more so it's about reducing um, reducing the revenues that are available. And I think what was really helpful about this report is they took a long view because governments report each year on, on their tax expenditures. And when they highlighted the differential in growth and how tax expenditures had grown so much more quickly uh, than program spending, it really highlights the policy priorities of, of the current government and also the former government. And I think the other part of that report that I, was really important and interesting was they took a distributional look at it. And what they hmm. found was tax expenditures uh, that they looked at in the personal income tax system disproportionately benefited high income earners. Actually, overwhelmingly. Overwhelmingly. More, more than disproportionately, overwhelmingly. Yeah. Go to those making 125000 a year and more, I believe was the number. That's correct. And when you dig a little bit deeper and you look, the fastest growth in tax expenditures was in the corporate income tax system and the majority of that was the small business deduction, um, then you really need to take another look at that as well. Because while our image might be the corner store mom and pop uh, uh, benefiting from that, there's been a lot of really uh, important research that suggests that really is a vehicle for high income earners to reduce their taxes. In which case, I go to Finn now and say, do you want to defend and or justify a disproportionate amount of these tax expenditures benefiting people who are at the higher end of the income scale? Uh, uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> let's, hear, let's hear the argument. I'd say, well, first of all, uh, you, we're using annual data in compiling uh, these figures. So if you're uh, late in life or uh, retiring, it might be time to sell assets and recognize your capital gains. So you're going to have lumpy years where you have relatively high incomes and that and naturally because you're selling assets, that's when the capital gains uh, or the low capital gains inclusion rate will benefit you. So it's absolutely you know, a matter of logic and math that that deduction or the other preferred rate is going to favor high income people overall. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'd like the film and, uh, and, uh, te and television credit to example. Uh, for instance, the difference in activity or where activity goes within North America is highly driven by trends in the exchange rate between Canada and the US. Sure. And when, it's, uh, when the Canadian dollar is low, uh, activity flows up over the border into Vancouver and into <laughs> Toronto and a few other places. That's the biggest driver. Uh, then where within a country is heavily influenced by provincial and state uh, uh, programs and benefits and how big their credits are and exactly how, many, how much of labor costs they cover. And there are services in, uh, in Hollywood that regularly update the map. So it's a map of every jurisdiction in North America with the list of credits and, uh, and benefits <laughs> available to you. And <coughs> as they shift, the activity just rolls from one place to another. So they have an it, impact. Kentucky is good this, Kentucky's hot this year, Tennessee's hot this year, then another year. But that's the Nevada. point, you, you gotta pay to play. If you don't offer them, you're gonna lose out. Uh, lose it, you lose out on giving away the uh, the tax revenue associated with the deduction. The activity moves, but uh, you know you, we have uh, a hefty skill base, uh, uh, activity base, mm -hmm. professionals in the business uh, in Vancouver, in Toronto, in Halifax. Uh, they're all going to be working anyway, but maybe not quite so much or on the same things if you didn't have the credit. Let me ask whether I can find any agreement between the two of you on this notion, and that is. If you have some program spending, if a government creates a program, there is, there's plenty of oversight for those programs. Committees look into it, the Auditor General can look into it. Anyway, there's oversight. How about for tax expenditures? How much oversight there? Uh, the answer is none uh, after the initial introduction. And uh, absolutely, it would be a good idea to have a more regular review of it. Uh, that's I, I agree entirely. Uh, they grow right. they grow like <laughs> mushrooms right. Right. Uh, mushrooms when <laughs> left alone. Uh, the uh, one thing that governments can do, and uh, we've seen this uh, federally and uh, in some cases provincially, is you identify a program and say 
no, that's, that's not really a tax expenditure, it is a program expenditure. So that goes over into the supply and estimates uh, process. Mm. So in principle, at least, legislatures, MLAs or MPPs or MPs do get a kick at the can when they, when they look at the supply bills or at the main estimates. Do they really have a hard look at these programs? No, and that's why these, these, uh, these uh, reports, such as from the Financial Accountability Office or the transparency reports that the governments, uh, that federal and provincial own governments produce, own finance departments produce, are very, very useful things. So they're reminders that these things are growing and attended. Hmm. Sheila, tell me if you thought this was uh, interesting information. Apparently, a third, fully a third of the tax expenditures that the Ontario government has in its budget are responsibility of the federal government. How did, can you explain, how, how does that happen? Well, it has to do with the tax collection agreements. And so part of the tax collection agreements between the federal and provincial governments is that the definition of income um, is determined by the federal government. Um, and that's, that's the result. Uh, that's how you result in those tax expenditures being federally determined. There are ways around it um, if... Um, there are ways in which the provincial government could des design tax policy to kind of move around it. Um, there are also ways in which they could probably negotiate with the federal government. Uh, I think the tax collection agreements are generally pretty efficient and you wouldn't want to stray too far from that and probably wouldn't want to stray too, too far from uh, a jointly determined definition of income either. Hmm. So you'd kill the film and television tax credits, is that right? You'd get rid of it, it, would, it would be on my target be on your list. For sure. Anything else you want to get rid of while we're at it? Well, I, ma I mentioned some of the fuel's preferences. Uh, I think we've gone... So the, the Northern Ontario fuel tax credit, you'd get rid of that too? Uh, let's have a look. We'll have a talk <laughs> in, in, in the back alley. This is a guy That's, not trying to get elected in Northern Ontario, obviously. Okay. Oh, uh, no, obviously. Yeah. And uh, the thing is, uh, when if you can take aim at a broad swath of boutique credits, uh, the money adds up and it allows you to uh, to offer broader tax cuts for everybody in other words across the board tax cuts uh, we did uh, we did that in the US in the mid 80s uh, we did it in Canada uh, also in the mid 80s where a bunch of big deductions and exemptions were, were chopped or knocked out entirely and it allowed bringing down tax rates for everybody and that's mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty fair, and it, it seems to work well for the economy. I do recall when Stephen Harper brought in a lot of tax deductions, for example, to put the kids in hockey, or for example, to buy a, a Metro Pass on the, uh, you know, the Toronto Transit subway, or the taking a bus or a streetcar. Uh, when the Liberals took over, they got rid of them all. And one of the reasons they said was, because they weren't actually doing anything. They weren't actually encouraging more people to put their kids in hockey, or ride the subways. They just rewarded you for essentially doing behavior you were going to do anyway. Um, you want to weigh in on that? Is that what's the value in that? Well, I think a lot of those boutique tax expenditures uh, have limitations because they they actually um, they're for appearances, right? And they're also a signal from governments who don't believe in direct public services uh, to say, you know, we're gonna we're gonna help you out. Do, you're, we're gonna help you do this on your own. But when you take a closer look, even at the children's fitness tax credit, it wound up being disproportionately benefiting high income earners who would do it anyway. Even if you got the full amount of the credit, I believe it was, you know, um, somewhere between 20 and $50. Um, and that's not going to pay for a lot of hockey. Um, and there were other sort of subtleties about it that it was a, originally defined in a way that um, it was the activities that young boys would participate in, but not mm. the activities that girls would. So, you know, there are like any program, it can be badly designed or it can be well designed. But I think stepping back, you look at those boutique tax credits, they actually more likely are, are, uh, will come from governments who really want to reduce the role of government and reduce the role of the state and say instead, here, we'll help you do it on your own. I mean, a tax credit for a Metro Pass for anybody who tries to get around Toronto um, didn't do much. You really need a big government investment in that and, you know, three levels of government, I think. Mm -hmm. Can I, just we down to our last 40 seconds here or so, can I ask you whether or not, because of this report from the Financial Accountability Office, we now know a lot more about this than we did before, does it argue for a much bigger debate over the need to overhaul the tax system entirely? Oh, we need a lot more reports, a lot more effort put on that because we haven't had a serious look at, uh, at the Canadian tax system in decades. 
Uh, the uh, the business uh, tax review was 1998-99. That's uh, that's 20 years ago now. Uh, absolutely, it's uh, it's time to have a hard look, both federally and provincially. I've been making this point for a decade. It hasn't taken yet. <laughs> <laughs> provincially, I think it was more than 50 years ago we had the last serious look at the tax code. Lancelot Smith was the guy's <laughs> name who did it. That's going way back. Anyways, good of both of you to come into TVO tonight and help us out with this. Sheila Block from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives and Finn Poshman from the Fraser Institute. Good to see you two again. Thanks. Good to see you, Steve. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.